I often get asked, why are Stradivarius violins so expensive? And why is Stradivarius violin the best? Are they the best? In my life, I have seen quite a few Stradivarius violins. It's been well over a hundred. So today I will try to answer those questions. and buy another 20 houses. Oh, what a lovely idea. Yes, it should be lovely, shouldn't it? I really like it. Oh, if you can buy me that diamond I always wanted. Yes, of course we can, dear. Now I just have to make another 20 violins to buy a bigger house. A much bigger house. 20 violins, maybe 20 ones. Who was Stradivarius? Was he this amazing violin maker? Did he have some special knowledge that other makers didn't have that uh, made his instruments so much better? So this is really interesting. So let's quickly talk about Antonio Stradivarius. So Stradivarius lived to quite an old age. He was born in 1644 and he died in 1737. He was born and died in Cremona. I mean, these are the streets that Stradivarius would have walked through, you know, nearly 300 years ago. By the time he died, the term being as rich as Stradivarius was a common term that they used in Cremona. Can you believe that? So why was Stradivarius so successful? Stradivarius came onto the scene relatively late in his life. And some people think that he may have learned from Amati, but there's also research that suggests that he lived with one of the most famous woodcarvers of the time. That woodcarver did a lot of the carvings in the beautiful dome in Cremona and it's magical work. And interestingly enough, the first Stradivarius violins were very neatly made and had some very intricate inlays and things like that. So it is quite possible that young Antonio first worked for a woodcarver and really honed his skills and tool skills and later went into violin making. Antonio's first known violin is from 1666 when he was just 22 years old but as far as being apprenticed quite often kids would get apprentice from you know from a young age you know 13 14 15 years old and would be quite skilled by the time they were in their 20s and often people didn't live that long so uh, you know they had to get cracking but Antonio lived to a healthy age of 93 years, which is just incredible. Now, how much are Stradivarius violins actually being sold for? The most expensive instrument sold at auction was somewhere around 16 million US dollars. But I've heard of instruments going privately well over 40 million dollars. And the, some people estimate the Messiah Stradivarius literally being worth hundreds of millions of dollars because it's in such an immaculate condition. So the prices are just staggering. And are the instruments actually that much better? Do they sound that much better? And interestingly enough, there has been a few studies done. And so one of the earliest studies was done in England. I think it was done in the 1970s or 1980s. And they got a few instruments. They got a few soloists and specialists. They popped them all in one room and they played the instruments. From memory, there were about five or six instruments a couple of a, a new one, some uh, a French nineteenth um, century one, and uh, uh, I think uh, there was at least two Stradivariuses. Nobody was able to pick the Stradivarius. 
in a room. And that was just with a single blind test. So the violinist actually knew what he was playing, but not the audience. More recently, there have been a couple of double blind tests. So the player didn't know what they were playing and the audience didn't know. So the way you do a double blind test, so you don't want the player to see anything. So they gave him darkened sunglasses so he could barely see anything. Now they didn't want him to hear much, so they popped on some earmuffs, but they also didn't want them to smell the instrument. So they put a dab of perfume on the chin rest, so the instrument smelled, that all the instruments smelt the same, because you can actually smell an old instrument when you're close to it, believe it or not. So, you know, they did the double blind test and, you know, the modern instrument won out hands down. There, it's all different. And, woo! <laughs> wow! So what, why are the instruments so expensive? It's obviously not the sound. Is there some kind of extra secret? Like, is there a secret to the varnish? Is there a secret to the timber? Now, they've done a lot of research. And now, with chemical analysis, they're actually able to very much to really pinpoint the kind of varnish that was used, even the kind of pore filler for the timber and the ground layer of varnish or color, as well as they were able to analyze the actual varnish, uh, which was shown to be made mostly out of linseed oil and resin. And uh, this varnish uh, recipes from the 1800s and, and later that actually use very similar varnishes. So it's definitely not the varnish. Um, you know, did he use some kind of different timber? But that has also been disproven, obviously, because there are other instruments that sound just as good. So what makes the instrument so expensive and so special? And my theory is the story. In the first place, Antonio Stradivarius was very, very famous already while he lived. So the Amati dynasty had uh, basically ended up becoming super well known around the aristocracy in Europe. They wanted instruments made in Cremona by the Amati family. So once Niccolo Amati died, Antonio Stradivarius was pretty much the only well-known violin maker left in Cremona. And I believe he was a very, very good businessman. So he worked out his models and he had templates for absolutely everything. So then, once he had a model, the instrument could be copied over and over and over again to produce exactly the same model. And also, I believe he he knew the tonal makeup of instruments, like the acoustics, so he would copy that as well. And so his instruments became the most desired instruments all around the world, which, uh, you know, which is amazing. You know, he, he kind of had it made. He had quite a few people working under him, especially later in life. There were years when he made dozens of violins in one year. Apparently made a, a, a few over a thousand uh, violins in his career. But there were also violas, there were cellos, there were lutes, there were guitars. I believe there's a harp even. So there were lots of other instruments as well as the violin, but the violin is by far the best known of his instruments. And a few well-known soloists played his instruments early on. But then, after he died in 1737, his sons continued the business for a few more years, but he kind of went into obscurity. And around that time, so, you know, a bit later, late 1700s, around the times of Mozart and Beethoven, Stradivarius instruments really weren't very desired. A lot of the German masters were far more preferred to Stradivarius instruments. So then later, some teachers recommended that Stradivarius violins would be the very best violins to play on. And those teachers happened to be the teachers of some of the most 
famous violinists in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And suddenly Stradivarius instruments really began to become more famous again. They really got a whole lot more famous in the middle of the 1800s by violin makers like Viome. Uh, also Hills was starting to sell Stradivarius violins and they started sort of getting this mythical idea behind them so this story was told that it was a real myth like these instruments were just better than others what I personally think made the instruments so much better was that they were only being played by some of the best violinists in the world and those violinists made the instruments sound amazing and then the story went on and the instruments got passed down to the next great violinists and again and again and so it's very rare that a Stradivarius violin really made it into the hands of an ordinary violinist unless they had a lot of money there were a few um, players that were an exception so now there are Stradivarius violins that were played by famous players like Niccolo Paganini or Fritz Kreisler, Yesha Heifetz, Vuitton, and some of the most famous violinists in the world throughout history. So the instrument, each time a famous violinist owns it, it the instrument kind of ascends in value. I guess it's similar to playing, you know, on David Bowie's instruments or um, Eric Clapton's guitar or, you know, what, what, other famous players of the, you know, rock players and and things like that. They fetch quite a tidy sum or, or Elvis's guitar, I mean, you know, would, would sell for millions. So really the value of the instruments went up. But now, I mean, Stradivarius made about a thousand, possibly 1200 violins. Now a bit, a few more than 600 remain. So it's a very limited number of Stradivarius violins in circulation. Of those, a whole bunch are actually being held by museums. So they nearly never come up for sale. So they're becoming more and more rare. And uh, I remember in the 80s and 90s when Stradivarius' instruments just passed a million dollars and sort of headed towards a three to five million dollars. I know the shop where I was working was selling Stradivarius violins around the five million dollar mark at the time. Not all of them, but but some, uh, you know, some of the really nice golden period ones. So once upon a time, Stradivarius violins were actually quite affordable. Not, I mean, not super affordable, but a million dollars was something that like a well-known soloist would be able to pay. People like Nigel Kennedy, Joshua Bell, um, Anna Zofi Mutter, all the all the um, players that came through the time when Stradivarius violins were somewhere between one and five million dollars. They were still affordable, but they've literally gone into the territory of the unaffordable, of the, you know, like, 10 million, 15 million, 20 million dollars, 30 million and more. Uh, that's no longer really affordable by one player. So these days there are funds being set up that uh, that actually buy an instrument and they insure it really well and then they loan it out to soloists. And then other instruments are just kind of just staying in a museum, hardly ever being played. And, uh, and then there's a few Stradivarius instruments that are just held by private collectors and they just like them. They just want to keep them. So it's really interesting. I guess it's similar to art. I mean, who, who said that Van Gogh's painting have more value than some other paintings, but he had a very compelling story and, and you know, ov obviously his art is amazing and I personally really find Van Gogh's art inspiring. But the man also had a very, very troubled life. And so the story, you know, the story probably per perpetuated the, you know, the myth and, and you know, and, and now those paintings sell for so much more. And some Van Gogh's paintings have sold over $75 million. So that's just incredible. And I believe that Stradivarius violins will at some point be over $100 million as well. 
um, and, and really be in the realm of unaffordable. But are they any better? The amazing violinist Chad Hoops changed his, um, his violin. He was lent a Stradivarius violin and he bought a Sam Sigmundowitz violin. It, it was the most expensive violin ever sold by a living maker, over $100,000. But uh, when I talked to Chad, he said it was the best thing he ever did. His modern violin actually responds so well and it was so much easier to play and he really has a connection. So you don't necessarily need to play a 10, 20 million dollar instrument to, to be a better violinist and to sound better. But uh, obviously, I mean, how amazing is it to hold the same violin that, you know, someone like Niccolo Paganini played? Like, like imagine that, like that you're holding in your hand and you have the opportunity to play this instrument. Like, like what a, what a gift you know, to, to, to know that this instrument was the instrument that the player expressed themselves through. But then, you know, the instrument really only is part of the story. Someone famously said to Yesha Heifetz, Oh, Mr. Heifetz, the sound of your violin is so wonderful. And Yesha Heifetz took his violin, held it to his ear and said, I don't hear anything. It really is the player who makes the instrument sound amazing. I mean, instruments have certain types of sound that suit players better. So that's really important to remember. There are lots of different sounds and some instruments just don't work. So an instrument that works well is actually like a well-oiled engine. Soon we're going to have electric cars, so that's no longer going to count. But like a really well, like it just runs really beautifully. And when you just touch the string, the instrument just instantly speaks and works really well. So uh, some instruments are a lot of work and it's because not everything is working in harmony with each other. But I'm confident that Stradivarius knew the, some of the physics behind the instrument or some of the theory, acoustical theory behind the instrument. There are makers now that also know some of the theory behind the instrument. So there's some really amazing instruments being made right now all around the world. This is my instrument, by the way, my latest instrument. But I think that the thing about the Stradivarius violin is the story. And I think that's why Stradivarius instruments sell for so much money because they are so desired and people will pay anything to own a part of that history. And, and like I said, it's, it's incredibly special. It, it is so special. Um, I've tried a few Stradivarius violins and uh, I played some that were really beautiful. I also played one that was extremely average. <laughs> I was actually kind of shocked. And uh, and uh, But then when we looked inside the instrument, there had been so much work done on the inside and there had been so many patches and doubling of edges and things like that, it must have just totally changed the sound from what it was originally. So anyway, I hope you've got a bit of an insight. So Stradivarius was definitely an amazing violin maker. Was he much better than some modern makers? Not necessarily. He was a fantastic businessman. He was fabulously rich in his time. When he died at age 93, his sons only continued the business for a few more years. His sons by that time were in their 70s. And I think they just thought, you know, like Stradivarius was such a power, Antonio was such a powerhouse that they probably thought, oh my God, finally we can relax. So they literally only made violins for a few more years. Then the, the fame probably passed on to Guarnerius. But very soon after that, Cremona was no longer known as the center for violin making. After that, that actually moved to other European cities and uh, or other places in Europe. And there were a lot of fantastic German violin makers 
uh, in the late 1700s, early 1800s that uh, that became extremely well known. So anyway, I hope that gives you some answers. I hope that way you understand a little bit more. I'm going to do one video on the story of a specific Stradivarius very soon within the month because there's a, a Stradivarius violin for sale and I'm very curious about it and how it's going to do. Um, if you like this video, remember to hit the like button. Uh, to find out every time I post a new video, remember to subscribe and hit the bell. The bell's important because when you hit the bell, you find out every time I post a new video. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Remember, your instrument is your voice and it's so important to have the best possible instrument or have your instrument working the best possible way. I've made lots of videos to help you uh, learn more about your instrument and find out how you can make it work better for you. So make your instrument work the best and then do some practice and have fun playing. Enjoy playing and keep making beautiful music. Okay, thanks for watching. See you guys. See you next time.